Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Let's uh, push on. Can everybody read that all right? It's like an, like an eye test this morning. Uppercase B, lowercase B. All good? Okay. All right. So we are going to uh, finish up this morning the first uh, uh, module of this course, our introduction. Last time we did a uh, a whirlwind tour of the history of AI. Obviously, I left a lot of stuff out. Just as you, just to refresh your memory, at the end of lecture two last time, you saw the sort of overview of the uh, all the different fields that are attempting to create intelligent machines, and you can relatively easily cleave all of these different subdisciplines into two different camps. Those working on AI that believe we will eventually create intelligent machines and that we don't need a body to get there. The other camp believes that the, the route to creating intelligent machines is going to require a body somehow. Embodied AI, embodied intelligence, robotics. What the heck does this term embodiment mean? We're going to spend this morning talking about exactly that. Any questions about the assignments, quizzes, installation issues, pyrosim? We're all good. OK, so here we go. As you'll remember from our discussion about Turing and the Chinese room last time, very, very difficult to define exactly what we mean by intelligence. So what we're going to do today to highlight this idea of embodiment or the embodied approach to creating intelligent machines is we're going to look at a whole bunch of building blocks of intelligence. If we can't define what intelligence is, maybe we can identify a whole bunch of the necessary components that go into an intelligent machine, including us. What are the things that you would expect to see in an intelligent machine? And then how might we go about in, uh, instantiating those, in, those building blocks of intelligence in a non-embodied ma manner, and then the same intelligent behavior in an embodied ma manner. So we're going to basically illustrate this concept of embodiment by looking at non-embodied approaches to creating intelligent components and embodied approaches. Yeah. OK, so let's go. Uh, what is an important thing for humans, animals, plants, robots, drones, xenobots? If we, if we want to consider them intelligent, one of the things that you would expect to see is that they're able to recognize patterns in the world and respond to them appropriately. So let's start with a very important building block of intelligence that most people would probably argue is important, pattern recognition. This is one of the early problems that computer scientists tried to tackle, um, going all the way back to the 1950s and the Dartmouth uh, conference. How do we create machines that see patterns out there uh, in the world? OK, we can sort of start to concretize or make this more concrete by asking the following question. How do you recognize objects in a scene? So if we're to stick a camera onto a robot or feed photographs into a computer, how might it start to identify there's a cat in that image, there's a this in that image, there's this particular person in this image. Please convince me I'm not that old. Who is this particular person? You still all know? Okay, good. All right, all right. Okay. So um, for you, hopefully, the moment I put up this slide, I saw a few of you smile. You not only immediately identified that there was a human being in this picture, but you identified a pretty famous and familiar human being. You did it so fast, you probably didn't even realize you were doing it. It feels effortless, right? I don't see any of you sweating. It wasn't that difficult, hopefully, for most of you, right? So back in the 50s, it seemed like an easy thing to do. This is going to be no problem. We'll either do it during the summer of 1956 or maybe into the fall of 1956. Shouldn't take us that long to write a computer program that if we give it an image, it can recognize whatever is in that image. Or even a simpler task, just separate the object of interest, the main thing that's in the image, from everything else. This is known in computer vision as the image segmentation problem. Find the Marilyn Monroe in the picture or the automobile or the cat. 
this is now a solved problem, but it's only been solved relatively recently. In retrospect, it turned out to be super, super hard. It was one of the most difficult problems in computer science, and here you can see a computer doing exactly that. How does a computer or an AI program do this? It requires millions and millions and millions and millions of photographs that don't include a cute kitty cat and millions and millions and millions of images of images that do contain a cute kitty cat. And gradually over time, a deep neural network, like we talked about last time, can gradually start to recognize the difference between these two types of images, so those with and without the object of interest. It requires huge, huge amounts of data and computation, as hopefully most of us know. That's the non-embodied approach to solving this problem. Can we do this in an embodied way? So we're going we're gonna to talk about a, a COG here. This is COG the robot. COG is going to try and solve exactly the same problem. It's going to solve, first of all, the image segmentation problem. As you can see, COG has a couple of cameras here. Uh, and it's able to, COG is able to see its world, can it identify objects from background? So we're going to, we're going to see how COG solves the pattern recognition problem, uh, uh, the pattern recognition problem in an embodied manner. Uh, optional reading for today, you can go back and read the original paper that reported these results, but I'm going to give you just the summary of how this was actually done. The solution, first of all, in all embodied approaches, is that we're going to deal with a machine that can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Sometimes that push and observe the result is going to be literal, like in the case of COG. And as we move on in the course and we look at more and more exotic machines, sometimes that pushing against the world is a little more subtle or metaphorical, but we've got that feedback loop there somehow. Action and sensing the reaction or the repercussion of our actions. One of the reasons that non-embodied uh, AIs like ChatGPT and all the rest struggle with cause and effect or causal reasoning, the reason they struggle with it is because they can't cause effects. Or they can by sending text to humans and seeing what humans type back, but it's sort of an indirect action reaction. One of the, the main advantage of having a body, of being embodied, is I can push against my world and immediately observe how the world pushes back. Yeah? Okay, all right, let's see exactly how uh, COG does this. So as you can see from this image, COG has two cameras. Uh, it's anthropomorphic, we heard that term last time also, shaped like a human being but missing some parts. Um, COG only has one arm and one hand. The researchers in this case, Meta and Fitzpatrick, did something kind of, it seems kind of odd on the surface. As COG was interacting with its world, uh, the two cameras are receiving two live video feeds. They wrote some code uh, that filtered out from those video feeds a lot of information. First of all, they pulled all the color out of those two video feeds, and then they further reduced every pixel in every frame of those two video feeds to a binary value. So basically, COG is seeing in black and white. It's represented in the cartoon here where a zero pixel is everything, uh, the zero pixels are everything that's grayed out here, and a one is everything that's not grayed out. Yeah? The cartoonist here kind of just drew in the details so you could sort of see, uh, you, you would know what's in COG's environment, but the only thing COG is seeing at this moment in time is a big blob of white or a big blob of zeros and then this blob of ones. So far, so good? Okay. Seems like kind of an odd thing to do. They're kind of, they're hobbling COG in a way. They're removing a lot of information that would otherwise be available to COG. Okay. COG, uh, uh, it can see very little. It, COG also knows very little. You, 
from your vantage point can see that Cog has two eyes, a body, an upper arm, a lower arm, a hand. There's some fruit in front of Cog. Cog knows none of this. The only thing Cog really knows at the beginning is Cog knows that Cog can send a couple of floating point numbers, three or four, can send them outwards. It can generate three or four floating point numbers. Those floating point numbers are sent to Cog's shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand, and those numbers are received by the motors at Cog's shoulder, uh, elbow, wrist, and hand. And the motor, uh, the motor says, okay, if I'm receiving a large number, I'm going to apply large torque. We're going to see this term over and over again. Torque is rotational force. So a big number means the motor, uh, a big number means the motor is going to really start to pull on the shoulder, elbow, or wrist. A small number uh, apply low torque and that particular joint will start to rotate slowly. So far, so good? Very, very, very simple. Okay. At the beginning of this experiment, Cog, again, knows very little, doesn't know what it's supposed to do. It just sends some random numbers out to its motors, and its arm starts to move. In this particular example here, um, Cog's arm starts to move into its field of view. What does COG see? It, COG outputted these three or four numbers. What does it see? More or less immediately. Like the outline of a similar shape that it's looking for? It sees an outline of something. There's this big black blob that starts to come in from its, the left-hand side of its field of view. Everything was zeros, and then it sends three or four numbers, and suddenly there's this big black blob that appears in its field of view. So Cog has pushed against the world, and the world has pushed back at this instant in time. So far, so good? OK. Cog is recording all of this information. So Cog is going to start to learn using this raw material of action, reaction. We're not going to talk about the learning algorithm in COG and how it actually learns. We're focusing on the embodied aspect of this experiment, how COG is using its body to pull information out of its world. OK, so it sees this black blob. And remember, the black blob are all the ones. And those ones are actually, I'm sorry, I think I forgot this detail. The zeros in its field of view represent pixels in which there has been no motion during the last tenth of a second. I'm sorry, I think I missed that detail. So this computer code that's sitting on top of the raw video feed coming back from the cameras sets a pixel to zero if there was no motion registered at that pixel over the last tenth of a second and it paints that pixel with the one. If there was a little bit of motion at that pixel a tenth of a second ago, yeah? So at the moment, in my visual field, most of my visual field is quiet. There's relatively little motion. I can see a few of your heads bobbing a little bit. There's a little bit of motion. The moment I do this, there is huge optic flow A vast majority of the machinery inside my eye is registering motion. Yeah? OK. So this is, these are pixels that are registering recent optic flow, and these are pixels that are registering lack of recent optic flow. OK, sorry. Back to the story so far. Cog has just sent some motor commands, and this big black blob appears in its left field of view, and then it stops sending those three or four numbers. What happens at the next instant in time? The hand disappears from the view. You, that, you said the hand disappears from the view. You know that. Cog doesn't know that. We're going to try and use language from Cog's point of view. From Cog's point of view, the big black blob in the left side of its field of view disappears. Everything turns white. OK, Cog sort of. Re records that information, is going to start learning, using it in a moment. Cog randomly sends another three or four numbers. What happens now? 
all the pixels are zero. It sends some random numbers again. Something else appears. Like Something else appears. It's only got one arm. The arm is here, but motionless because it's stop sending commands to the motors. Now it starts sending commands to the motors again. What it, what what does Cog experience? Blob reappears where it was before it disappeared. The blob reappears in the same shape, in the same position. Well, that's interesting. So Cog stops sends it, sending commands. Everything goes white again. Sends some more commands. The same sized and shaped blob appears in the same position. Maybe moves a bit and then winks out of existence the moment it's it stops sending those three or four numbers. What can COG start to learn using that little information it's collected so far? That things remain in the same position. What, like, like I, I, uh, object permanence. Object permanence, okay, great. Another important thing that early humans take a lot of time to learn. There's a theory in child psychology, why, why do children around the world love peekaboo? It's the most famous popular game in the history of the human species because peekaboo teaches object permanence. Something that is occluded, something important like mommy's face will rapidly reappear in more or less the same place in a short period of time. So the nickname for COG became baby bot for exactly these reasons. COG in the first few minutes of operation starts to make some stupendous discoveries like object permanence. There's this object, whatever this thing is, it appears whenever I send numbers out into the world and it disappears whenever I stop sending numbers out into the world. What was the, you, you read it pretty clearly, um, what was the benefit of having it only like recognize moving objects versus, like is, is, it just, is that just like an easier computer vision problem? They, yeah, so the question is why did they remove most of the information from the video feeds and only leave behind whether or not there was motion there. They wanted to see what COG can learn in an embodied manner using just that information. A lot of what our, our eyes evolved to do is exactly that, recognize motion. Back in the day, and arguably we still are apex predators, very important to be able to recognize motion and lack of motion, where's their motion, when was their last motion, and so on. Yeah. How much can you actually learn if that's the only thing you can receive from the outside world? Okay, so COG does some learning. It doesn't know, it, it doesn't know anything about this blob. It comes up with some arbitrary term for this, this phenomenon, not necessarily even this object. We're not really talking about objects. We're talking about relationships between COG and the world. When I send numbers, the blob appears. When I stop sending numbers, the blob disappears. That process, COG is gonna call self. That seems to be, I'll just pick an arbitrary term, self. That's what self is. If you asked COG what self is, it would say self, self are, is the collection of blobs that appear when I act and disappear when I don't act. So far, so good? Okay, so COG slash baby bot continues uh, moving and stopping to move its arm, and suddenly, through these random motions, something new happens. Self, this blob, suddenly changes shape. It suddenly grows this big round blob on the end of the self blob. It's hit the apple. What happens in the instant of time after uh, in the next instant of time after cog stops sending commands to the motors just after it's come into contact with the apple so when the apple's round it might like bubble so it would see a little bit more other stuff yeah absolutely so cog's mind is blown holy cow i've never seen this before there is a new blob that remains for a tenth of a second or a half of a second after i stop sending numbers to the world. I've never seen that before. It keeps it doing its experiments and its hand by accident comes back in contact with the apple again and suddenly the same thing happens. Okay, so COG starts to realize during its learning process that there is stuff out there that's different from self. 
Cog thinks for a while and says, I'm going to call that the world. There's self, or self and let's say other, other, yeah? This is another thing that young humans and young uh, mobile animals spend a lot of time uh, doing is distinguishing between non-self and self. I'm not having good luck with pens this morning. Okay. How do you know where your body uh, ends and the world or the non-self begins? It's actually not an easy thing to do. Luckily, Cog here kind of stumbled into interactions that caused that to happen. Um, I feel like we use a lot of sensation. So that, like, I, I guess it, watching myself hit the table doesn't actually, like, when you're numb and you kind of, and you kind of like, don't realize that you're touching, like, your own face or something versus, like, kind of the feeling of your at your fingertips? Absolutely. So if you ever had the dead arm experience, wake up in the middle of the night, and you've been sleeping on your arm and all the nerves have gone dead in your arm and you're, you're half asleep, it's a little scary for a moment. You're not quite sure, is this thing me or is this something else, right? It, again, feels effortless to us as adults when we're fully awake, but that illusion can actually disappear sometimes. It's not as obvious as it seems. As you pointed out, we have tons of more sensory apparatus at our disposal than COG does. It's very limited, but even in this very simplified experiment, Cog can start to embark on this discovery process, and it's happening because of interactions with the world. It's not saying the world is everything that's not shaped like this. It's not a geometric description. It's a description between these processes, send numbers, stop sending numbers, and this is what happens, and this process, send numbers, don't send numbers, and something different happens. Yeah? So COG is starting to build up an understanding of self and everything else based on differences in actions and reactions. Yeah? Okay, so uh, we'll just call it maybe non-self. So as COG continues to bump into the apple accidentally, COG can actually start to learn more things about non-self. You actually kind of mentioned it. What else can COG start, start to learn? about this mysterious thing called non-self. It has different shapes or forms. It has different shapes. So this thing that has this particular blob shape remains permanent for half a second or a second after I collide with it. But if I collide with this thing down here, this long thing, I bump into it, it also appears for a brief period after I stop moving, but it winks out of uh, existence much faster because the banana doesn't roll, right? So Cog starts to realize that non-self is not some big undifferentiated mass. There are different kinds of things out there in non-self. There are things that have this kind of blob shape that have this particular property they stay permanent for a second more. And things of this shape, which remain permanent after ceasing action for a shorter period of time. So Cog thinks to itself and says, all right, I'm going to invent a new concept called shape. And there are different kinds of shapes. I'll call things like this round and things like this non-round. So now we're getting into geometric words, round, non-round. But from Cog's perspective, the definition of a round object is not this. It's for another second. It's description, if Cog were able to tell you what, what the definition of is for round, Cog would tell you in the language of dynamics. I do this, then this happens, and so on. So far, so good? OK, we could spend the rest of today talking about Cog. We'll spend just two more minutes. What else can COG start to learn about if it, COG only has this collection of fruit in front of it and it's kind of randomly moving its arm around and watching what happens? What else can COG start to learn about non-self? Um, if one object bumps into another and makes it move, ah. you discover that there are more different kinds of non-self that they can interact with each other. 
Absolutely, right? It's not all about me, right? So Cobb's ego is going to start to take a blow that self is not the only thing that can trigger, that can trigger action in the world. Self can cause the apple to start rolling, but the apple might roll and bump into these other small things that jiggle for a little bit and then wink out of existence, right? So there's cause and effect out there in the world that maybe I started the ball rolling, literally, but it's not all about me. There are other things that can happen. Great point. What else can Cog start to learn about non-self? Uh, different objects have different kind of motion. Absolutely. Absolutely, right? So the, the banana, when pushed, also displaces, but the shape doesn't change. So let's call that slide, Cog says, let's call that sliding. The ball keeps, uh, it sort of changes its shape as it's moving. We'll call that rolling. So Cog starts to invent action words, starts to invent uh, verbs. What else can Cog start to learn? Can Cog turn its head? Uh, I think it can, but for this experiment, that's not so important. But you're right. If it tur if Cog turns its head, what happens? It sees everything. 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 All the pixels turn to white, right? So it could start to learn about other things about the world. Yep. Uh, could it be like um, nuanced in how much, like how much force it applies? Like basically, like does it, does it twerk? Absolutely, right? So uh, baby bot acts like babies and starts smashing everything in sight and learns that some things are squishable and some things aren't. Cog starts to learn that once you squish something, it doesn't most usually doesn't become unsquished. There are non-reversible processes in the world. There's a gazillion things that Cog can start to learn with just two eyes one arm, one hand, and a couple of pieces of fruit in front of it, and the ability to just see motion or lack of motion. Tons of things Cog can start to learn. As a f side effect of learning all these things, Cog has also solved the image segmentation problem. Cog can start to learn how to see foreground from background, and Cog doesn't need to expend a lot of effort to do it. In deep learning, there's a huge amount of computation that goes into recognizing the outline of Marilyn Monroe, and we're not going to go into the details of how that happens. For COG, it's easy. <laughs> there it is, right? I, my, uh, the optic flow circuits in my eye picked that up effortlessly. I know exactly the shape of that chair. I just pushed it. I know how much it weighs. I learn a heck of a lot about the chair with very, very little computation. And that only works because you innately have a circuit in your brain that does that kind of motion detection. Absolutely. Like it was given the capability it needed for that to be a problem. Absolutely. It was all built in from the start, right? So you're right. There is still a lot of effort that goes into this and me doing this. But it was effort done by my, our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors. It's all built in. You're right. There's no free lunch. But in terms of Cog itself, herself, it's himself, whatever it is, much less effort for the individual. Yeah? But correct me if I'm wrong, Cogs, would, Cogs wouldn't be able to recognize the same set of fruit if it was just a picture. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, this work has mostly not yet been done. So I mentioned in this field, there's a lot of open questions. You can, it's not too difficult to make a robot that starts to get useful learning information from physically interacting with the world. None of you are actually pushing against the fruit. You're just looking at a picture and listening to me. How does all of that embodied experience become a scaffold become a scaffold for doing a lot of this reasoning without literally pushing against the object and observing the world push, pushing back in embodied cognition there is a uh, there's a theory doesn't have that much evidence yet that that's what we do as young children, we spend a lot of time literally pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. And that becomes the raw material 
that we use to learn. It becomes the training wheels for us to gradually get better and better at doing object recognition without having to actually push against Marilyn Monroe and see how she pushes back. Hasn't really been tested or validated yet. Lots of interesting work that could be done in this area. Great, great point. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Sure. So, uh, babies, when they learn to interact with the world, they can learn from other people doing the same thing. Yep. The thing with robots is usually they have different shapes and um, different, like people feel it differently. Okay. So, the knowledge cannot be transferred from one machine to another. Yep. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Like, because we can transfer knowledge to each other, but. Yeah. Great, great question. So you're asking questions originating from developmental psychology, which we will see many times throughout this course. The psychology of how mostly humans develop, right? So th this is child psychology or infant psychology. Ch uh, infants and children are very social. They're looking around and trying to learn from things in their environment. Cog at the moment is a non-social uh, learner. There's no other teacher in COG's environment. It's literally just interacting directly with the world. What human, young humans do is infinitely more complicated. We're also learning from others. And for infants, if they're lucky, they're surrounded by things that look more or less like them. Mommy, daddy, caregiver, and so on. And, however, it is a challenge for them also to learn who or what to learn from. Same challenge for machines. Cog kind of looks like us, but kind of not. If there were various humans or other robots around Cog that were moving and not moving and reacting to Cog, who or what should Cog learn from? It, it's a difficult problem. Difficult for humans, also difficult for machines. Good point. Yes? Good question. So what happens if we put a different apple in front of COG? It depends on how well it's learned, given the raw material we've talked about so far. We have not talked about how COG learns. So maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe for COG, that apple, which to us is familiar, it's just another apple, it might, it might be a completely new experience for COG. It's a slightly different shape. Half of it is rotten, so it doesn't roll so well. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at one. We're looking at one sensor modality at the moment, which is it's not even vision; it's optic flow. Your question is about uh, what's known as multimodal learning, and you mentioned it as well. What happens if you watch your hand and you see your hand stop moving, and at the moment you see your hand stop moving, you feel pressure on your fingertips? You're getting information from two modalities visual and haptic information. Wow, holy cow, there's a sudden change in both of those modalities at exactly the same time. That is a very important uh, piece of knowledge. That's a huge topic in robotics, and we're gonna see several robots that, that do this. They actually combine different uh, sensory information from different modalities. Yes? Uh, I have a little bit of random question, but how do the, uh, how does it store Okay. Like if, if it's for everything, then how can we have enough memory for that? Okay, yeah, that's a really great question. So you have tons and tons of information flowing in right now. You're sitting in a chair. The haptic information coming from your legs and your butt and your back, there's tons of it. You're probably not even aware of it. Is it being stored? Is your spinal cord throwing away that information? Is it, is it actually being stored somewhere? You're just not consciously aware of it? Again, great point. Very difficult question to answer. In theory, COG should keep everything because maybe something will be useful for its learning down the road, but that's a lot of information to hold on to. Can uh, all the information that's coming in, are there cases where you can say, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to need this later. And uh, if it's visual information, your eye throws it away before it even gets to your brain. Do the peripheral parts of your body, the things that are far from your brain, 
Do they do, send, do they do pre-processing? Do they filter out information before it gets to your brain? The answer is it's complicated. The answer is always it's complicated, but it's a, it's a great point. So again, if we want to make intelligent machines, we got to try and answer this question. What should they hold on to and what, if anything, should they throw away? Okay. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so that's pattern recognition. We can do it in a non-embodied way, throw, throw a gazillion photographs at a deep learner and hope for the best, or with COG, it can do it with less information, but there's been some pre-processing. There's a little bit of smarts beforehand. Let's look at a different building block of intelligence. As I mentioned, it's hard to define intelligence, but my favorite definition, if I, even, if I was forced to come up with one, is the ability to not let yourself end up in a dead end in the future. I'm going to do things now to make sure I don't have limited options in the future. In order to do that, there's the word future in that statement. That means you've got to be able to think ahead somehow more, uh, uh, more, more simply known as planning. You need to be able to think ahead somehow. Planning was something that the early AI pioneers spent a lot of time working on and thinking on. And eventually, they were able to create an AI that was able to plan sufficiently ahead in a game of chess to beat the world champion in a single game, and then a short time later, beat the world chess champion in an entire match. Anybody remember when this happened? Roughly when this happened? It was in the, it was in the 90s. So this was the late 90s. There was a huge uproar at the time. This is it. Superhuman AI is here. We now have machines that can beat humans at chess. And chess is the hardest thing that humans do. So everything else is easy. It's the end of the world. The machines are going to rise up. There aren't going to be jobs in 1998, 99. Machines are going to take over all the jobs, put us all out of work, and so on. Sound familiar? OK. All right. This, uh, so this was IBM's Deep Blue. Deep Blue is a non-embodied planner. It's a computer program running in, it was a computer program running inside a mainframe that could not push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Someone typed uh, the chess positions into Deep Blue, and Deep Blue would spit back its move and so on. Despite the fact that it's not embodied, it did pretty well. Again, required huge amounts of computation. OK. Here's the embodied approach to planning. Um, many early robots were able to plan. This is arguably one of the very first. This is Shaky the Robot, developed in California uh, during the 1960s. It was a wonder of engineering. If you look carefully, uh, you'll notice that most of the brain of this robot is on board the robot. The actual computer is in the robot. It was carrying most of its smarts with it. A huge engineering feat in the 1960s. OK, so what would Shaky do? The researchers would place Shaky at some random position in the room. And as you can see, they would put these big, heavy block uh, obstacles at various positions in the room. And then they would tell Shaky, get out of the room. This was one of the first escape room uh, experiments done with machines rather than humans. What would Shaky do? Uh, it might be difficult to read this in the back of the room. It's got a laser range finder here. It's got a television camera. It's getting a whole bunch of visual modality information. It's getting a whole bunch of visual information. It takes all that information and uh, crunches all of those visual numbers down to create a simulation of its environment. This is just some random physics engine picture that I had lying around. This isn't actually from Shaky, but this was more or less what Shaky was doing. It would make a very simplified virtual representation of its environment. Then, once it had that virtual representation of its environment and its virtual representation of itself, it would start to plan an escape route through the obstacles to the door. Question? 
was your was it building this model like it was this kind of like pre deep learning like what or, oh this is very pre deep learning so no like, neural networks here at all so it was actually just taking all the input and like doing the processing it was doing the processing there was a huge complicated computer program that somebody <laughs> wrote and gave to shaky so that shaky could take all its visual information and construct a virtual environment and then another computer program that somebody wrote to plan a route through the virtual obstacles okay once it had actually come up with a route that it was confident would allow it to escape the room, Shaky would wake up and start moving one inch and then stop, come to a halt, scan its environment, construct a whole new description of its environment, do this whole loop again for a few hours, another few hours. Why was Shaky the Robot called Shaky the Robot? Given that description. Yeah, it would literally shake to a halt and then move and then move. Okay. Knock on wood, heaven forbid, if fire broke out in this room, is this what you're going to do? Our distant, distant ancestors, maybe they didn't do exactly this, but if they did do this, and there was a fire, right? Whatever it is that we're doing, it's not this. This is not to pick on Shaky the robot. It was definitely an advance at the time. If you, if you were to think about it, before I showed you Shaky the robot, if I said planning, how do you plan? A lot of, a lot of people will often give a description more or less like this. I look at my environment, I build up a model of what the room looks like, I plan my escape route, and then I execute it. Remember last time we talked about the Turing machine. It's, it's very familiar and comfortable for us to think about information coming in, internal processing, and then action. If you take that too literally, it can lead you in some directions that don't really seem like what we do. Why would it not just keep moving in one direction until it like had the turn and okay. then reprocess? Okay, why does it not keep moving until it has to turn? Uh, Shaky is a very big machine. It's a very, very heavy machine. It's a very expensive machine. Shaky's uh, repre internal representation, this is a very uh, controversial term, representation. We'll come back to it many times in this course. Shaky's internal representation of its environment is never perfect. I think the table is here, but it's actually here, so I'm gonna go around it, bang. Not such a good thing for Shaky to do. The researchers wanted to make sure that uh, Shaky never experienced a false positive. It never came out, had a wrong representation and something terrible went wrong. Better to stay still, uh, sense, think, plan, act, sense, think, plan, act, sense, think, plan, act. Safer, uh, safe for shaky in the sense that it doesn't hit anything, but eminently unsafe if there's something that's happening in which you need to react quickly. It seems like what we're doing more is like just constantly sort of adapting to whatever is like coming to us instead of like making this plan the whole way. Absolutely. It feels, once you start to think about shaky, the hackles on your neck go up, right? You're like, gosh, that's not what I'm doing. I'm continuously adapting my internal representation of the world and planning and acting simultaneously, right? One of the nice things about shaky is it sort of wakes us up from this torpor of thinking like a Turing machine. Sense, think, plan, act. Not such a good thing to do if you're an embodied agent in the world with literal skin in the game. It matters, right? If there's a fire, it matters. So whatever we're doing, it's probably not this. And we're going to come back shortly to an example that's the complete opposite of this. Yeah. Regardless of whether this is a good or not solution, here's an embodied approach to planning, here's a non-embodied approach to planning. As before, with pattern recognition, you can see how it's not just about Shaky's body, it's about Shaky's uh, interaction with the environment. Okay, 
We're going to pause for a moment, and we're going to take a few moments to talk about this possible building block of intelligence. We could spend several months talking, talking about this topic. We're going to agree right now, we're going to take five minutes to talk about this topic. Free will. Okay, deep breath. Here we go. We all have free will. Feels obvious. I choose to come to class or not. I am free to choose to come to class or not. It's blindingly obvious. Libet and his colleagues back in, in the early 90s said, wait a second, let's actually test this idea. They came up with this very famous and still very controversial experiment. Here's the cliff notes of the Libet experiment. They instrumented human subjects with uh, EEG, which stands for electroencephalograph. Uh, electroencephalograph, which picks up electrical activity um, on the surface of the brain. They also wrapped a little uh, sensor around the human subject's index finger, uh, which is an EMG uh, sensor, which records muscle activity. What does EMG stand for? Myogram, fancy word for muscle. So EEG, EMG, yeah? So we've got human subjects wearing a weird looking skull cap uh, on their heads and they've got uh, a little uh, piece of tape wrapped around their finger. These human subjects were then given the following instructions. Watch this clock and you'll see there's a moving second hand. It was actually a, a, a moving light. And at any time you are free to choose. At the moment you choose that particular time, flex your finger. So watch the clock going, going, going. I choose to move my finger and I do. I'm, watch I'm a human subject. I'm watching the clock. Da, 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 it's going around. I choose to move. 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 Okay. The human subjects were then asked to report w the exact time points at which they made that decision to freely move their finger. So far, so good? Okay. So what did they see? Um, for, they did this with multiple different people. For each person, they saw that at the time points that those subjects reported that they chose to move their finger, there was a repeated switch uh, change in their EEG patterns. That particular EEG pattern was unique for different human subjects. We're all unique. But there was a definite change there was the same change in EEG at every moment at which the subjects chose to move their fingers, which Libet and his colleagues interpreted as the human subjects are not cheating. They're doing what we asked them to do. There's some, some repeated change in their brain signal at exactly those moments that they reported. They also saw that there was a reliable change in EMG 200 milliseconds later which looked good. That's more or less the time it takes for a decision to go from your brain to your index finger. So it looked like most subjects were obeying the instructions of the experiment, which is choose and then act. Or from the subject's point of view, they act at the moment they choose, but that action takes about a tenth of a second, two, two tenths of a second to actually happen. So far, so good. Everything looks perfectly reasonable. Turns out that for each of these subjects, there was also a reliable change in EEG patterns three tenths of a second before the subjects thought that they had freely chosen to move their fingers. Okay, now things start to look problematic. <laughs> we don't have free will. <laughs> <coughs> You ask these subjects, they'll say, I chose. At six seconds past uh, the minute, I chose. But actually, 5.7 seconds, or whatever it is, three tenths of a second before that, there was a reliable change in brain activity. What I'm telling you is just what happened in the experiment. What you want to take away from that experiment, or what you hope to salvage from the results of that experiment, are up to you. I am not here to convince you that you don't have free will. You are free to decide that on your own, maybe. 
The point that, of why we're talking about this is to illustrate a warning that you're going to hear me repeat over and over in this class. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Introspection is dangerous. If I asked you how you plan before I had primed you with this experiment, most of you would have said, uh, I look at my world, I think about how to, to get out of this room as quickly as possible, I plan my route, and then I execute it. Seems obvious. Probably not how we do it. So again, in all these experiments, uh, in, all, in all of this work, just remember that thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay. All right, I've kept to my word five minutes about this. If you're interested in the Libet experiment, it's fascinating. I would encourage you to read the Libet experiment first. Go to the source. There are replications of this experiment. Some of them show that there are report, reporting to have shown that there are reliable brain changes, not just three tenths of a second, but whole seconds, two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds before you think you made the decision. There are other experiments that uh, have results where the authors claim that it invalidates Libet's experiment. It, there's a huge literature that's grown up around the Libet experiment. Go have a look if you're interested, but it's all tangential for this course. I'll entertain one question or comment. Well, I was just thinking, is there any way that it would just like Uh, very, very much, very much so. Maybe you freely made the decision, but you just, you're not clear about when you made the decision. That's a way to salvage free will from the Libet experiments, which is disproved by other experiments and around and around we go. G great point, great point. Okay, remember, thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay, so back to embodied cognition. We just saw Shaky, which planned in a way or acted in the world in a way that when we see it being done by machines, starts to convince most of us that whatever we're doing, it's not that. So in the 1980s, uh, Rod Brooks came up with a completely different way to control robots than sense, think, plan, act. Sense, think, plan, act. And then around and around we go. Brooks said, that's terrible. That's not going to work. So let's do something opposite. And this opposite became known as subsumption architecture. Imagine, uh, imagine that we've got a simple wheeled vehicle, like the Breitenberg vehicles that we saw last time. And imagine that uh, we've, got, uh, we've got the coward running inside that machine. When we talked about the coward last time, that was a robot with two sensors, two wheels, uh, and two ipsilateral connections. So it would turn away from light. Imagine we replace the light sensors with bump sensors, which means that now we have a Breitenberg vehicle that's terrified of bumps. If it ever gets bumped, on its front right side, it turns to the left immediately. Yeah? That's what's represented here. Obstacle sensors avoid obstacle and send commands to the motors, which cause the robot to turn away from objects. It's terrified of touching objects. So far, so good? OK. What happens if it's not bumping, it's not touching any objects? This vehicle will just drive around, and if it hits an object, then suddenly this part of the robot's brain takes over. If it's not doing that, it's driving around, but it also has two audio sensors on its front. And as long as it's not touching any obstacles, it's paying attention to its audio sensors. And if there's loud noise over on its left, it'll turn to the right. So there's a second coward circuit inside the robot. And that uh, noise, that noise fearful circuit is holding on to the motors. It's controlling the behavior of the robot until it suddenly bumps into something. And then this circuit subsumes or takes over control of the motors. There's a more urgent uh, reflex that overrides this less urgent circuit. And we can keep going. If uh, it's not touching anything and everything is relatively quiet, 
then turn towards the light. And we can keep stacking these one on top of another. What do you get? If you were to take just these three circuits and stack them in this way, put them inside a two-wheeled robot, put that robot in your living room, it's the middle of the day, there's nobody home, so it's relatively quiet. There's light filtering in from the window. It's a little bit more light on one side. So the robot draws a gradual arc towards the light streaming in from your window, but then bumps the couch and heads off in another direction, starts to draw an arc, gradually comes back to the light from the window, and keeps going and going and going. What do you have? It not only kind of looks like a Roomba, it's exactly the Roomba. So Rod Brooks was the director of the AI lab at MIT, which I mentioned last time is the mecca of uh, AI. He was at the top of his game in the 1980s and came up with this idea, which as you start to run this in your head, you realize, yeah, you've got a, ver you've got a machine that's continuously moving, like somebody mentioned here. It's not even building up a representation of itself other than there's more light on my left than my right. No physics engine, no nothing. A very lightweight machine moving around. Uh, it might hit objects, but it'll then move away from them. It doesn't get stuck uh, on objects. Wow, amazing. Why don't we spin off a company? Let's call that company iRobot, and let's maybe make vacuum cleaners. That's exactly what Rod did. He eventually resigned his post as the, at the director of the C-Sale at MIT, which no one had ever done, seems like a crazy thing to do, to go make a vacuum cleaner company. All of his colleagues thought were laughing at him at the time. Who's laughing now? Okay, so again, we have an embodied approach to it's not really planning, but at least embodied behavior, right? This robot is using its body and the distribution of sensors and its two wheels in a very efficient, elegant way to actually do useful work, like vacuum your, your carpets. You don't need a lot of heavyweight computation. You don't need a million photographs of your living room. If you think about embodiment carefully, and you design the body and the simple internal wiring in the right way, you get useful behavior. Right? Breitenberg uh, lived long enough to see the Roomba. I don't know if Breitenberg felt validated. I hope he did. OK. All right. So just to sort of sum up, we've looked at a few building blocks of intelligence, pattern recognition, planning, acting well in the world, and we looked at non-embodied and embodied approaches to this. So we're going to uh, come back to this term of embodied cognition. This term itself actually comes from psychology. Um, again, uh, people have been studying humans for a very long time and thinking about how humans use their body to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back and using that raw information to learn to, to survive and flourish in the real world. Roboticists have appropriated this term to also think about if we're going to create intelligent machines, how might they use their physical bodies to get the information they need to survive and thrive and do whatever we want them to do in the real world. Yeah. Okay, you can say, well, wait a second. Even non-embodied things like ChatGPT have a body. They exist in some server farm or farms somewhere out there. They have a physical body. Your desktop has a physical body. Your desktop cannot push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. So embodied cognition doesn't mean physical cognition. It's not just about physical materials. It's about how a machine or an organism uses and exploits its physical materials to survive and thrive in the world. Yeah. OK, so embodied cognition is really about the way in which you, the way you process information is affected by the fact that you have a body. What do we mean by the way of processing it or, or exploiting the body? We do this all the time, and, and the Roomba does the same thing. If you have a body that can move, 
you've got motors somehow, and you can see the moment you move, we've got our little Lego robot over here that can see this big object out here. The moment it moves, its distance to this other object changes. There's an immediate repercussion of an action. The, the speed of that reaction is useful. There's information in that as well. What are some other ways that we exploit our physical bodies? When I see my hands stop moving and I feel the pressure and those two things happen simultaneously, that facilitates or helps me learn that those two things are actually reporting the same event. They're reporting the fact that my hand has collided with the board. I'm already ex I'm exploiting the fact that I'm receiving multimodal information, visual and tactile, at the same time. And thank you, I hear it as well. Yeah. What other aspects of your physical body do you exploit to learn about the world? You can go anywhere. You can go anywhere. Okay. Yeah. So I can use. Yeah, absolutely. I can use my motors to actually create new kinds of loops. I can go here, and then now I'm involved in another uh, sensor motor coordination that I couldn't do when I was back here, right? There's an opportunity for me to move and start to generate some new interaction. Would it be like you see something far away, but then you can't see it immediately, like when you're clapping? Or you could, you just like, I don't know. Distance or Absolutely, right? Things that are far away, they're hard to estimate how far away they are. If they're making noise, that helps. Absolutely. We can like turn our heads around and like build a, I, I know you said don't use representation, but we, you can build like a pretty good model of the room that you're in kind of just like at a glance and then it still exists. Yeah, absolutely, right? So I can move my head, I can move my eyes. And as I do, I see all of you move. But some of you move faster than others, which helps me if I am building a 3D representation, I immediately learn that you all are closer to me than you all are. I can, I, if I close one eye, I don't get depth, so it's a little hard to do, but the minute I start to act, I get additional optic flow information that helps me judge depth, absolutely. I exploit self-motion to learn about relative distance. What else? There's millions of ways you exploit your body and its interaction with the world to learn about the world, to get useful, actionable information. Like self-preservation purposes, like learning what can like, injure you? Uh, absolutely, right? Things move, other things move and they impinge on me. And I can press against things and feel the rate at which the pressure starts to increase. Edge of a table, okay. Edge of a knife, different. The rate of pressure, localized pressure on my palm starts to go up really, really fast. I'm going to treat that action reaction as uh, a yellow card. Things are about to get very dangerous very soon. Um, we can use just kind of spaces um, and that's like not even I like I, I feel like you can hear if you're outside versus inside like okay like, yeah e echoes absolutely where, where am I I I've, I'm just in some situ where where am I what's here is this a dangerous situation a useful information uh, environment or we can use tools like kind of like extensions of our bodies okay and yeah so we're great point so tools we're talking about exploiting the body Right? You have a body with which to learn about the world. You've got these things which can do things like this. Great. Okay, now something new is happening. I feel a new action reaction loop. How does that help me? I've got this new information, but so what? Well, we might, we might be able to like, use tools to explore or use tools to manipulate our environment in, in various ways, depending on. Okay, we talked about uh, Blade Runner last time, right? The movie 2001 with the apes at the beginning, one of them picks up a bone and starts doing this and starts to do this with increasing force and suddenly does this and hits another bone and that bone breaks. Wow, okay. 
For that ape, it was not able to break a bone itself, but if I do this, suddenly now I can cause repercussions in the world that weren't possible with just this. What a discovery. Other examples of exploitation. I feel like smell is underrated. Like smell is underrated? Smell if dinner is cooking, like okay. in the oven or a gas leak or something. What probably our arguably our oldest sensor modality smell. We're primarily visual creatures these days, but yeah, absolutely. How do you exploit smell? Tricky, hard to think about. Yep. You can smell if food is rotten or not, something safe to eat or not so safe. Okay. Now maybe action is involved a little bit. Maybe do what the fruit fly does, right? You could act as a Breitenberg vehicle, yeah? Isn't there stuff that's like smell that activates memories? Abso absolutely, right? So there's some very subtle things that are in there, memory. We're gonna focus, we're focusing right now on exploiting action and reaction in the here and now. Absolutely, we can link what's happening, the action-reaction loop that we're causing right now with things in the past, but let's stay in the present for the moment. Think about us as bipeds. You're obviously sitting and you're at rest right now, but hopefully for a considerable period of the day today, you're doing stuff like this. What am I exploiting right now? Your body has structure and balance that is well suited to that form of motion. Okay, yep, my body is well suited to this type of motion. We're gonna talk about legged locomotion later in this course, but how? Let's let's think about this for a moment. How is it well suited for doing stuff like this? Um, you can distinguish it from the, this is a, being able to sense uh, the basically like your internal shot response. Absolutely. So the vestibular sensor, your inner ear, another sensor modality, uh, it detects acceleration. So if I'm walking and start to do this, my inner ear tells me and tells my body to do this. Yep. So it keeps me balanced. We are one of the most efficient land movers on the planet. If you're in relatively good shape, you can go 15, 20 miles on half a Big Mac. And if you do the thermodynamics on that, it's incredible. There's a theory that our ancient ancestors, when they were hunting in packs, they walked and just walked their prey into exhaustion. It's unproved, it's a theory. But what is known is we are incredibly good, long distant, efficient movers. We're not the fastest land movers there are, but we can go very long distances with very little food. How? How do we exploit our bodies to make that happen? Well, most of like bipedal locomotion is less walking and more just falling forward and catching yourself. Absolutely, right? So you've been doing this for decades. Maybe you've never actually paid attention to it. When you leave class today and you walk wherever you're going, I want you to actually pay attention as best you can to all the muscles in your legs, your lower back, your arms. For those of you that have or have taken a class in this, what's, what's happening? What's happening with your musculature as you do this? It's your, like every, every step you take, you're actually adding very little energy to the system versus a, a lot of it is about how like you know how like when you swing your arms when you walk it's all about like continuing forward momentum while like transferring it absolutely okay so i'm going to walk again here we go not a good way to do things that's not going to last very long as you mentioned and you'll feel this after class most of the time uh, the muscles in your legs are slack the minute your stance leg, the one behind you, leaves the ground, it becomes what's called your swing leg, and it's called your swing leg for a reason. The moment your toes leave the ground, all the muscles in your leg go slack, and your leg acts like a pendulum. It just swings, swings forward, and your momentum will eventually cause your heel to come into contact with the ground and your swing leg will become your stance leg again. The moment that happens, you tense the muscles in your leg and your momentum carries you over your tensed leg and 
Each of your legs, your individual leg, the muscles are slack for half the time. S relax and swing, tense and stand. Relax and swing, tense and stand. Isn't there also an argument that we like became upright so that we could like take in a lot more oxygen? Okay, so why did we become bipeds in the first place? It's a fantastic question. There are very, very many hypotheses for why that happened, and you just mentioned one of them. We'll come back to this discussion when we talk about bipedal locomotion. For our purposes today, we're just illustrating that if you have a body and you have a little bit of smarts up here, you can come up with lots of different ways to exploit your body's interaction with the world. That's embodied cognition. Okay, I want to make sure we finish today's lecture. we got five minutes left, so bear with me. We just talked about embodied cognition. There's a related idea called situated uh, cognition. The definition is a little tautological. The way you process information is affected by the fact that you're phys physically situated in the world. For psychologists, situatedness more or less means that you're getting information from the world in real time. You, we are all situated here. Maybe you're not actually moving right now. You're not exploiting the physical forces of your body, but you're receiving sensory information in real time. You are situated in the world. Uh, a, a passive deep learner that's receiving text that was written by someone long ago or receiving an image a photograph that was snapped by somebody in the, in the past, it's not situated. It's receiving information that was generated or processed early, uh, earlier. Okay, so a common example of a machine, that, uh, a device that's uh, situated but not embodied are embedded devices. So I can't remember if this room has a smart sensor or not, but if we all leave this room and it's empty for a few minutes, the lights will shut off. I know that's true in the Davis Center. So the, that sensor in the ceiling is situated. It's detecting motion or lack of motion. And when it detects lack of motion for long enough, it switches off the light. But that intelligent light sensor can't move around in its environment. It can't exploit its physical mass related to the environment. It's situated but not embodied. Everybody see the difference? That intelligent sensor is still physical, right? It exists in the world. It's got a physical body, but not embodied in the embodied cognition sense of the word. OK. OK. Um, uh, from time to time, I'll use this term of a complete agent. Agent is going to be like the term vehicles from last time, from Brayton Bird. Agent is a catch-all. Agent could be a plant, a bacteria, uh, an animal, a human, a drone, a robot. It's sort of a, a container term. A complete agent is an agent that is a situated agent and an embodied agent. You are all situated and embodied agents. You are all complete agents. The intelligent light sensor is a situated agent, but not an embodied uh, agent. Uh, OK, we'll do this very quickly. So complete agents are subject to the laws of physics. How might, they, how might complete agents uh, exploit that fact? We just saw bipedal walkers. There's an example of a complete agent that exploits the fact that your leg is subject to the law of gravity, which allows it to act as a pendulum. Gravity often feels like something we're fighting against. You might not have thought of this before, but you're actually exploiting it. Gravity is your friend, not your enemy. We generate sensory stimulation when we move. We've already seen that example. The moment you move in the world, you suddenly get a whole bunch of new information about the world that is difficult or impossible to get when you're standing still. As you move about the world, you also leave a literal and figurative imprint on the world that you can then later exploit that imprint on the world. What's an example of us impacting the world as we move about our daily lives, and then we exploit that fact later? Or others exploit the fact that you've left an imprint? Like you walk through 
through like a thing of snow and maybe meet a path. Other people will try and walk right through there so they don't have to walk through the snow bank. Absolutely. I always hope that this lecture is on a snowy day. Not quite true. I can see some paths out there, right? Shortest path from building A to build it, building B. After every fresh snowfall, those paths reappear. And your fellow students are exploiting the fact that you as a complete agent have left that impact on the world. Sorry for rushing. I want to make sure that we finish this today. Let's try and fill these four boxes. Give me an example of a technology that is both disembodied and not situated. Like a computer. A computer, a traditional desktop. OK. How about situated, non-embodied? We just saw an example. What was it? Embedded device. An embedded device, an intelligent light sensor. Embodied and situated agents. Us, be, uh, cog that we just saw. How about this one? Embodied but not situated. Can you think of an organism or a machine that is embodied but not situated? Like a remote control drone. Yeah. A remote control drone, maybe. If we assume we don't use the drone's sensory information, uh, you're right, though. If the drone might be taking pictures, but not using that sensory information to drive its own action. So, our, yes, maybe a, a remote controlled drone kind of fits in this category. RC car. An RC car, also remote controlled, which I don't think has many sensors or any sensors on it. Yep, it's capable of action and interacting in the world, but not, not, not uh, recording the repercussions of its actions. A common one is the first generation of industrial robots. They were programmed to weld the car door, but they weren't actually sensing the fact that they were doing it or whether or not that welding event was successful or not. OK. Sorry for the speed at the end there. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on assignment two. Grads, you're working on three or four. Have a good rest of your week. See you Tuesday. Yeah, bro.